Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we are very excited to welcome our, our speaker. I'll just give us a quick introduction both to what we do and our, our speaker today. But so this webinar, as you probably know, is being hosted by the CARP Research Lab. We are a loose collection of international and interdisciplinary scholars. And we study character and character assassination, reputation management, crisis communication in the realms of politics, science, and entertainment. We host conferences, we publish scholarship, and we teach courses, workshops, and seminars. And you'll hear more about the first two things in a second here. We started this quarantine webinar series um, as a way to promote our handbook that came out in January of 2020. Similar, simpler times. Martin is holding up the physical copy there for you. Uh, mine is in my office, which unfortunately I haven't been allowed to enter since... March 13th of 2020. Um, but as you may have heard Eric ask about, we are also have a new textbook sort of primer to the subject coming out with Rutledge later this summer. It's now available on Amazon called Character Assassination and Reputation Management. And we're really excited, A, because the price point of this book is a lot lower than the first one, and because it provides a really good overview of the different arenas and things that we tend to think about when we study character assassination and reputation management. Um, I did wanna uh, bring one big announcement to your uh, awareness before we jump in today. And that's that we are going to host a, a virtual conference in September of 2021 on cancel culture and character assassination, a really important topic in the news today. I will dump the link to the call for papers in the chat again, as soon as I turn the floor over. Um, but we're asking for short proposals to be submitted by May 3rd, 2021 to our colleague, Sergey. And as much as we would love to gather with you um, in person, we're also looking forward to taking advantage of the virtual platform since so many of our friends and colleagues are international. And so this will allow us to welcome them in their scholarship in an easier and more cost effective manner. And again, I'll, I'll dump that link for you in the chat here. Um, so I'm excited then to welcome our speaker, Eric Desenhall, the CEO of Desenhall Resources um, and an all around crisis management, communication, um, leadership strategy guru. Um, what you may not know about Eric Desenhall is that in addition to the great work he does doing crisis communication and crisis management, he's also written 11 books, only three of which are actually nonfiction books, but he's written a lot of very fascinating uh, fiction works as well. He's also a frequent contributor and uh, has media appearances on all of the, the good ones like NPR, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, all of that good stuff. And his writing has appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we as uh, character assassination scholars love Glass Jaw, his book on defending fragile reputations in the age of sort of mediated social media scandals that we live in now. And his most recent book is called False Light. And my understanding is that y'all are going to be talking about that today. So welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. And welcome Thanks, again Jennifer. to Sergey, who is a CARP Research Lab co-founder and will be uh, kicking off the conversation. Please, I should say, um, once Sergey and Eric get started here, if you wouldn't mind putting yourself on mute so we don't get any feedback, but please do use the chat function to share your thoughts as our, our speakers are talking and put any questions in the chat as well. And we should have time to get to those at the end as well. All right, thank you, Jennifer thank you. and uh, Eric, welcome uh, again. Uh, so it's such a pleasure to see you. So my first question, I guess, will be about you uh, because we uh, hear so many good things about your practice and your writing. Uh, so who is the Eric Desenhall? Because I know you started in the Reagan administration and you had a fantastic career in crisis communication because you opposed to be called a public relations professional and maybe you can explain why. Uh, so you worked with Michael Jackson, you worked with Tiger Woods, you had a lot of uh, remarkable and interesting clients in your lifetime. So, but you also write fiction books. So are you a practitioner, a crisis manager, uh, a fiction writer? So who, who is Eric Desenhall? 
Um, that reminds me of the Saturday Night Live skit from 40 years ago where they're debating, um, is it a dessert topping or a floor wax? And Chevy Chase comes in and says, it's both. Um, so um, let, let me give you the quick version. I, I had worked in the Reagan White House when I was very young. I had more hair then. Uh, I then went to a large uh, public affairs firm, Porter Novelli. Um, it was the feeling of my then boss and I that the PR world was addressing crises as communications problems, not as conflicts. We saw it in a much more uh, aggressive manner. We, we, we believed that you can't apply communications tactics to what is basically a conflict. And our view was viewed and still is viewed by a lot in the PR industry as, oh, that's a little, that's a little bit aggressive. Um, we're, I'm kind of a, uh, unapologetic uh, about that because, you know, I, I don't think if you were to look at the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's a misunderstanding. <laughs> it's not like one day the Palestinians and the Israelis are going to get together and say, oh, thank you for clarifying. You meant that West Bank. Now that I know and that we've communicated, we're all friends. It is not a communications problem. It is a conflict. And where you stand on it is, is where you stand on it. And so a lot of what I tried to do, I mean, the firm was founded in 1987, is to bring um, a conflict look at, a political look at what was a corporate look. Um, because usually the PR industry, what they're always doing is, let's tell our side of the story. Well, what if nobody wants to hear your side of the story? I had the CEO of an oil company say to me a few years ago, we need to do with Twitter what Trump does. And I said, okay, let's talk about that. Why don't we, um, and by the way, for those of you who don't know my sense of humor, I have a dark sense of humor and sometimes joke. So I said to this oil company person, you wanna use Twitter like Trump does. So why don't we tweet out, environmentalists suck and should be shot, how about that? And he said, well, we can't do anything like that. I said, well, that's what Trump would do. So you can't say, let's do what Trump does because Trump's um, attitude and, and, and punch uh, is what makes Twitter good for him. And what this oil company guy, what does he want to tweet? He wants to tweet, we care. Well, who wants to retweet that? Nobody, nobody wants that. Most of our clients are large corporations or uh, large institutions. We avoid individuals. We also don't discuss our own clients. I, you know, you had mentioned Michael Jackson. Our name came up in trial. So I, I never revealed that. We were hired by a legal team, the people who owned his debt. On the Tiger Woods front, we never worked with Tiger Woods. We worked with a corporate sponsor. That also was not revealed by us. In a lot of these sports scandals, it's the... Um, it's the, the sponsors that call the shots. So, you know, one of the strange things about our business is we do not put our clients on our, uh, on our website. I am amazed that people who claim to be in our industry apply for awards and have award ceremonies about best handled crises. If I, dis if I did anything like that, I would be out of business immediately. We just don't do that. And that's one of the reasons why I write fiction, because I, I you know, in... I guess uh, seven novels, I am permitted to use my experiences to make up stories about how things go on and in false light, which I know we'll get to, a lot of what I do is I look at the smears and the character assassination that I've seen and I talk and I deconstruct it in a plot narrative about how these things unfold without of course talking about my own clients. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so uh, I know the whole experience of writing a book sounds quite intimidating. And that's why we have co-authors. But you managed to write all of your books uh, yourself, except for um, the best latest one. Yeah. yeah, Best of the Enemies. Um, so how does it go? I mean, how tell us more about your kind of writing process and how long would it take you to write a book like that? Well, it's, it's interesting with uh, false light. It began about five years ago with 
two simple principles. One is what would happen if a guy who's gotten away with everything his whole life found himself on the receiving end of somebody just like him? The other premise is how do you handle it when the world gets a hold of your child? Uh, I mean, I have two kids, they're grown. Those were two things that were bothering me. And I started to put together what became false light. And then I got distracted because I was approached to do this true story of uh, a Soviet KGB agent and an American CIA agent who were assigned with turning each other into spies for the other side at the height of the Cold War. And they ended up becoming best friends. Well, by the time I emerged from writing with my co-author, Gus Russo, Best of Enemies, again, a true story, an interesting thing had happened. Harvey Weinstein, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Cancel Culture, The Rise of Trump, The Russia Investigation, Troll Farms, Deep Fake. So by the time I got back to False Light, I finally found what I was going to do. I was going to incorporate Me Too, a sexual predator, character assassination. And so it took a while. It took about five years. And once I came up for air, it was about a year or two to actually write False Light once I had it. But I don't always know. Uh, I don't always know what I'm doing right away. And sometimes things happen externally that I mean, I, I never considered False Light to be to have a sexual predator in it until Me Too blew up. And I thought, this is something we should talk about. And in terms of character assassination, the reason why false light is tied to that is in the book, you have a young woman who it is post assault. You don't see an assault in the book. Um, you have a young woman who is afraid of coming forward and making an allegation about a media figure because she is afraid her reputation will be destroyed. You have my alter ego, an investigative reporter in his 50s, who is on disciplinary leave because his reputation is being attacked by a new generation of reporter at his paper who don't want him there anymore. You have a bad guy in a sexual predator who makes his living as an ambush journalist, destroying their reputations. And the way my reporter character chooses to avenge the assault is to use his own smear tactics against him. So it is a jubilee of character assassination all, all the way around. And I, and I wanna be clear, you know, one of the things I did is I talked to a friend of mine, I talked to, to experts on sex crimes, serial killer crimes, a friend of mine who's a rape survivor and documentary producer. And, you know, one of the things we talked about is character assassination cuts two ways. It's a, it, it is a neutral term. The young woman who is facing assault has her character on the line because if she comes forward, somebody who doesn't like her in seventh grade is going to say, oh, she was always a liar. But the guy who's being accused has a character assassination problem. So there's no value judgment in that. I, I place a value judgment in false allegations, but I don't really place a value judgment on character assassination as a weapon. I mean, Harvey Weinstein had his character assassinated, but most of us believe we, he should have. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Eric, uh, so what would be your kind of hmm. central message? Um, because uh, if somebody would ask you, so why did you spend all this time actually writing about character assassination, about all these awful practices? So what are you trying to tell the world or our society? I think that we have to understand <clears throat> the climate that we are living in, in order to be able to stop the bad. Because the big lie of my industry, the crisis management industry, I mean, you have to understand when, when I started the firm in 87, I don't know that we were the first, but we were certainly one of the first. And I would tell people what I did for a living and they would go, I don't, you do, I don't, what? Now I tell people what I do and they say, my sister-in-law does that. I mean, you have TV shows and movies about crisis managers. And a lot of what the whiff is, is you hire this guy and I have a way to erase the internet. No, we don't. Um, you know, I spoke, I, ha I was approached years ago by a member of a royal family that was facing 
a big controversy. And the essence of my message to her was, you are looking for an enchanter, a guru, a wizard. They don't exist. K Street, Blackfriars, Madison Avenue, and Wilshire Boulevard are filled with these people. They are lying. We cannot control all of this. We can diagnose it. We can fight back. But in order to, you know, the, the assumption is always that there's somebody who knows how to do this and wins every time. And the truth is, it's true. The Russians did interfere with social media and the Trump campaign did use Twitter. But I would say the people who succeed in mass manipulation, it's only a small percent because I'm called all day long by the richest, most powerful institutions and individuals that exist in the world. And with all their money and power, oil companies have never succeeded in getting people to like them. <laughs> and I mean, nobody has ever succeeded in getting people to feel good about capitalism with all their money. So we simply can't say that because this manipulation is happening, that it always works. But I can say, if you read False Light, you'll walk away or end glass, you'll go, I can't believe what's going on here. And that's the first step. Well, speaking of glass, Joe, uh, one of uh, the chapters in glass, Joe, is called Social Media is the Problem. And you also refer to crisis managers as janitors. So could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. Seven years ago, if you were in a corporate meeting and if you were wearing little rectangular glasses and you said the word social media, people would go, oh, he gets it. There's a genius. Now we're in a situation where I'm seeing top executives call me into their offices, pretty much bolt the office door and quietly saying, this social media stuff is actually the problem, isn't it? <laughs> and I go, yeah, it, it is. Simply because a technology exists doesn't mean it's good. And it doesn't mean you can control it. And I think that I have seen time and again, large institutions and corporations think they can fight back on social media when social media is uniquely a vehicle in most cases for spreading negative information. And so much of what my clients want is, but look at the good we do. That is simply not interesting to people who traffic in social media. Uh, so that's, that is the challenge there. You had a second part to your question. I just, I, I just spaced for a second. Uh, what, what, what was uh, yeah, that? You, yeah, you refer to crisis manager as oh. a janitor, you know? And yes. Yes. So uh, why is this kind of uh, analogy? Well, our job is to take a mountain of horse manure and God willing, turn it into a mere pile of horse manure. Um, you know, on any given day, a large corporation will go into a Madison Avenue firm and they'll walk in and there will be TVs all over the place. Oh, these people have TVs. They are on top of stuff. You will be greeted in the lobby by Pierce Brosnan or Margot Robbie on the fourth carbon, who all they do is fly around the world and bring in business. You will then be escorted into a conference room where there will be a presentation that begins with a crisis is an opportunity. Oh, that's so wonderful. No, it's not. You will then hear the words, we need to get ahead of the story, which is a wonderful sounding phrase that has no meaning whatsoever. Because by the time you are in a situation that I'm in, you're not ahead of the story, you're under it. A lot of my job, I always tell people at my firm, we are not the first firm you should hire. We are the third. Because the first firm you hire is the one that makes you feel better. It's the gentle snowfall. It's a crisis, it's an opportunity. The second firm you hire is the fixer, the guy who's gonna make the call. He's, he's gonna call, you know who he's gonna call? He's gonna call the guy. And know what he's gonna talk about? The thing, 
He's going to you pick up the phone. He's going to call the guy and he's going to talk about the thing. He's that connected. Well, he's lying too. Eventually, you get to us and we go through the very messy, ugly business of trying to solve a problem that is not going to be solved soon because a lot of what our clients faced, I mean, look, not all of their accusers are wrong. <laughs> I mean, there really is pollution. There really are medicines that have bad side effects. There really are young people being molested uh, in sports organizations and churches. So a lot of what I have to do is light the road so that the client understands what it is they're facing and begin the process of solving it, even though it's not going to happen right away. And part of the problem, you know, you raise social media. One of the reasons why corporations are so bad about it is everything with them is immediate metrics. Show, you know, how do we measure success? Well, we've been at this two days. Well, we need to measure it. Putin doesn't have to measure success in two days. The Arab-Israeli conflict, they've been at this for 5,000 years. They've got a lot of time. And you know, part of the problem is if you're going to have power on social media, you have to, sorry about this, I have to, uh, you have to um, spend a lot of time and a lot of money. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, Eric, I know that you don't like to have um, clients from Hollywood. And uh, why is it that you kind of avoid uh, working with entertainers? For num number one, they're deadbeats. They don't pay. Um, and uh, you know, I've met a few that have I mean, there are some executive, I mean, people, there are corporate types there who kind of understand our world a little bit, but what an entertainer believes is that your payment is you get to know this guy. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have children to put through college. I have a grandchild. I have a staff of uh, a bunch of people I have to pay for. I can't get stiffed. And for every person who says you have to pay, there's a line up and down Wilshire Boulevard, Madison Avenue and K Street who are willing to not be paid. The other thing is they are surrounded by people who lied to them. And they don't have people who say, you cannot do this. You cannot engage in this behavior. Generally speaking, a corporation wants to solve their problem. I mean, if you think for a minute Boeing is happy that they have planes go down, they're not. They want to get out of this. But a superstar probably wants to continue engaging in the bad behavior that they're engaged in. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, he's not a star, but in his warped mind, he had a good thing going. He did not want that to end. It only ended when Megan Toohey and Jody Cantor at the New York Times ended it, <laughs> uh, and so and so did the law. But I, you know, I have to ask myself: Do I really want clients who have no interest in paying and who have no interest in changing their behavior? And frankly, I'm not that hard up. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, I don't want to do it. I, I don't. I wouldn't say I would never do it again, but I have really turned it down uh, a lot. Um, one thing that you uh, once told me about that kind of was really interesting to me and uh, I found extremely intriguing is this concept of firing a client. Uh, so what is that? Why would you fire a client? Can you do that? Well, you, you can. I mean, it's, it's not a fun thing, but, you know, every corporate scandal, uh, I mean, I spend my living being lied to. OK, and a lot of what false light deals with is lie upon lie upon lie. And one question is, how do you know somebody's lying to you? Well, the beginning of every corporate scandal I've ever worked on uh, begins with the same three words. It's all BS, although the word BS is spelled out. Well, the Justice Department doesn't bring down a 41 count indictment that they completely made up. It may be a bad case. They may have bad witnesses. 
but it's not entirely complete BS. And a lot of what you have to, to ask yourself is, do you want to be representing people who are going to hurt you for representing them? Probably the biggest career mistake I've made, and it's a big one, is failing to realize the price that I would pay and that my firm would pay for representing controversial parties. Because it's not unlike an it's not it's not like an attorney where in the American system we all know that a serial killer has an attorney. There's nobody out there going, "What? A serial killer got a lawyer? I, I've never heard of that." We know that. But what I failed to realize was that people would say the very fact that you are working on this controversy means you are part of the original sin. So I have to ask myself, do I want to put myself in that situation? Do I want to get sued? Do I want uh, a multiple person New York Times investigative team chasing me? Not because I committed a crime, but because I worked on something controversial. I mean, there, if you look online, there's stuff about me that he worked with Enron. The truth, I went to one meeting and said, I'm not sure what we could do for you, but from now until the end of time, you will see online, and he was involved with Enron. Was it worth going to that meeting? I don't think so. Um, so the reason you fire a client or don't take one on is because you're going to get jammed up in something you don't want to get jammed up in. It's because your reputation will suffer. It's because you won't get paid. I mean, generally, the, the worst are billionaires. Um, I mean, we were approached a few weeks ago by a billionaire. And, um, you know, we always draw up a contract. And my, my partner in charge of that said, do you think they're going to come through? And I said, of course not. They're going to get a contract. They're going, they're going to get the initial retainer. They're going to be shocked that they have to pay, and then they're going to vanish. <laughs> and I know that after 34 years in my own business. I didn't know that 20 years ago. Well, um, a lot of um, our members were intrigued about your work with people like Michael Jackson, and they wanted to learn more about that experience. I mean, uh, would you uh, feel comfortable talking about that and just telling us about that? Well, how? yeah. I can talk about public domain things. I can't, you know, talk about private. But, you know, when his people first came, I asked the question I always think, ask. And by the way, it was for the what eventually became the child molestation trial. And my question was, uh, what do you think I can do for you? And one person at the table said, well, you know, um, a lot of people think Michael's weird. We need to address that. And I said, well, what do you think I can do about that? Um, you know, he spent decades cultivating weirdness. He wasn't really as weird, but a lot of these, with these celebrities, they like this idea that they're not like you and me. They're, they sleep in hyperbaric chambers. You know, they love that weird shtick. But then when people say they're weird, they don't like that. And I said, there's nothing I can do to help you with the weirdness. And they were a little annoyed because they're used to Hollywood publicists. And I said, what else do you think we can do? And I said, well, when these allegations surface, um, you know, so many of these, this generation, they don't remember Thriller. And I said, I can't get 1984 back. I don't know how to do that. That is beyond my talent set. And so, you know, a few people were annoyed. And one person said, well, what can you do? And I said, if I understand these allegations correctly, this is going to go to trial. And from what I understand, the accuser, the family, has a criminal record, including accusing other people falsely of molesting their kid. In a court of law, that is reasonable doubt. The goal is acquittal. And there may be things that can be done to hammer that you cannot convict somebody if there is reasonable doubt. 
So he was acquitted. Did we succeed in getting his reputation back? No, <laughs> but he was acquitted. And you know, a lot of what we have to look at is what is the best outcome, the best achievable outcome. Not what is, I mean, there's a difference between a wish and a strategy. The wish was not, we get 1984 back. I can't do that. But a lot of what I deal with in corporations, um, I mean, you, you remember the whole subprime thing. Uh, we had a client involved with that and they wanted their reputation back. And we said, we can't do that. However, there are people, I mean, you cannot send people to jail who obeyed a bad law. And that was what was hammered. And ultimately, I mean, there, there were some, some bad legal things that happened, but our client did not go to jail and the company merged and survived. So the goal was much murkier, but the goal was not, we're gonna get our image back because that was beyond our capability. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so I would like to talk a little bit about your, um... Uh, your relationship with the public relations industry. And again, uh, sorry for bringing back that subject because I know in Glassjaw you have several uh, myths of the PR industry that you debunk. So can you just go over maybe a few of them and just tell what is it that the PR industry is trying to promote that would not necessarily work well in the crisis management uh, context? Yeah, the best way to answer that is I had um, a client say to me, you know, before we go into the CEO, you need to stop using the term adversaries. We don't, at, here at, you know, one, two, three industries, we don't have adversaries. I said, well, what do you have? And she said, we have stakeholders. And I said, well, when the Manson family showed up in Sharon Tate's kitchen, were they stakeholders? Um, it didn't go over well, but the point, the point that I'm making was um, corporations like happy talk. They don't like under, they don't like um, the notion that they have conflicts and the PR industry, it's, you know, I, I, I call it vanilla drift. Everything goes to vanilla. They don't want to fight. And they, by the way, not fans of mine, because we've taken a lot of business over the years from them. And part of the problem gets to, they don't want to go to war with the press on behalf of one client, because they have lots of other clients. And so it's not unusual for, um, the PR industry to be giving advice that benefits their billing as opposed to advice that benefits the client. I mean, right now, I mean, the biggest trend that I see is if you go into an industry under fire and recommend a $70 million ad campaign with little girls running through fields of tulips with daisies in their hair, that ad campaign will be approved it will achieve precisely nothing in terms of resolving the problem, but it will um, make the people who paid for the ads feel better. So do you want to solve the problem or do you want people to feel better? And I think there is a serious ethical issue in continuing to make clients spend a lot of money on useless things that solely drive up your billables that really don't help the client. Uh, I think it's an ethical issue. I think it's a tactical issue. And, um, but the biggest thing that I see with companies now, especially in the age of Me Too and Black Lives Matter is they don't, they don't wanna fight anything because it's not in their, and by the way, they're not wrong on this. It's not in their interest to fight. It's their in interest to surrender immediately. And sometimes you have to. I mean, my job is not to be a hothead. Um, my job is to usher something out of hostilities as soon as possible. Um, so 
you know, what you're seeing, I mean, what you saw now in the wake of the George Floyd tragedy is companies falling all over themselves to spend money on initiatives to that really don't have anything to do with social justice, but just kind of stop the revolution internally. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to look, but that's fine if you acknowledge that that's what it is. I mean, what's better, talking about diversity or practicing a diversity thing? And, and the issue that I have with corporate social responsibility is not corporate social responsibility. It's that it's become a rhetorical issue, not a meaningful, uh, not a meaningful change issue. And are, do you want to be sincere about it or do you just want to talk about it? Because right now, anybody who says the word, you know, diversity or transparency is beloved. And, you know, to me, transparency is just a word that means I want dirt on people I don't like. And I had a, I had a corporate uh, person say to me, um, we just went on our annual retreat and we came back with our, our, our motto for the next year. And I said, do you want me to tell you what it is? And she said, no, I, I'm calling you to tell you what the motto for the next year is. And I said, no, but I'm going to tell you what I think it is. And we were laughing. And I said, your motto is theme is transparency. And she said, how do you know? I said, because virtually every other corporation just came back from an annual retreat and chose as their theme transparency. Here's your problem. You are fighting labeling, it was a food company legislation in all 50 states, hundreds of localities, and in 60 countries. That is the opposite of transparency. Yet your theme is transparency. If I were working against you, I would light you up. And of course, their adversaries did and should have. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so uh, there is one question from the audience that I uh, would like to ask you. Uh, so what tactics uh, does Eric typically take on behalf of his clients? So I know you work very closely with defamation lawyers. And maybe you can uh, speak about that side of crisis management, because we in communication think that you can solve anything with communication and public relations? Well, that's, I mean, you, you articulated, you answered the question you asked a few minutes ago better than I did by saying, you know, PR firms throw communications tactics at, at things that are not communications problems or, or are only partially. Well, the bag of tricks can include several things. A lot of what we do is advisory work. I mean, we had a client that was, accused of a very bad environmental practice by a well-known um, environmental group. And my question to them was, is there any way you can get out of doing this bad environmental practice? And they said, well, you know, we could probably phase out of it in five years. And I said, why don't you? And the answer was, well, we don't want it to make it seem that this activist group is getting credit for it. And I said, who cares? Give them credit for it make a deal with them. And so a lot of, I mean, what's so bad about that? And also the, the advice was, let's work at a deal and partner with an adversarial group and say in the next five years, this particular behavior we're going to get out of. So it's advisory. Um, another thing is we will, we often find allies. You know, if there is somebody who says your product is bad, are there people who need your product who need to be mobilized? We do that, uh, unapologetically, by the way. Um, the other thing is we do meet, we, we arm wrestle with the media. Um, you know, false light is a term from defamation law. I should have said that at the beginning. And what I'm about to say is relevant to all of this. Defamation would be if I wrote an article that said, Jennifer is a bank robber. And, and she could have a defamation case against me. However, in order to prove defamation, she would have to prove that I knew she wasn't a bank robber and I did it anyway. That's very hard to prove. There really is no defamation law in America. Now, um, no practical defamation law. False light would be if I wrote an article about bank robbers 
And in that, are, and you had all of these famous bank robbers pictured, but in the corner, I had a photo of Jennifer and said, Jennifer works at George Mason University. Well, somebody who turned those pages could say, bank robbers, Jennifer, boy, I had no idea she was caught up in that. That's false light. And a lot of what I do in, in, in the, the novel is show how you can destroy somebody by implication, not by true defamation. But in terms of a lot of what we do is in order to prevent, a, we're more effective on the front end than the back end. Because once the story says Jennifer is a bank robber, she has to decide whether she wants to spend money suing because she will now be on trial. People who she knew in seventh grade will, who don't, didn't like her, which I'm sure isn't true, will come forward and make allegations. You are on trial if you sue for defamation. However, if we knew that 60 Minutes was pursuing a story about Jennifer being a bank robber, we could on the front end go in and say, we know this is what you want to allege. Here is why you can't do it. And a lot of our practice works on the front end to push back and put lines in the sand of what you can and cannot do. The media do not like that <laughs> because they want to be able to say what they want to say. And so, whereas a conventional PR firm will say, we all work together, what we're saying is, our job is not to make it easier for you to defame our client. So that's another thing we do. The other thing we often do is we work all we find alternative media. I mean, one area where social media is good is it, it is a stalking mechanism against other media outlets. The very same journalists who say they don't pay attention to social media lose their minds when they're criticized on it. And if we, I mean, the most defensive people I have ever encountered in my life are my friends who are journalists. I mean, as you know, you know, in Glassjaw, there's nobody I'm tougher on than industry. But the people who really get crazy about when I criticize them, journalists. Um, I posted a quote on Facebook that is a quote from one of my characters in, in False Light. And usually, you know, I mean, we're on Facebook, so you know that I tend to be funny and not, I, I don't like to fight. The only people who were ticked off about the quote were journalists. You can't say that, that's not true. Well, here, here are people who want love, robust First Amendment debate, but if you criticize them, they don't like it. We understand that, and sometimes we'll have to fight on social media or find alternative me media to push back. I mean, when my career began, we had three nightly network newscasts and three national newspapers. And at 4.30, unless there was a national tragedy, everybody went to bed. In the 90s, we went to a, a daily news cycle, from a daily news cycle to hourly with cable. Now there is no news cycle, it's constant. And so the rules that worked 30 years ago, well, we need, to, we need to get out there and tell our side of the story. Well, that was fine 30 years ago. The problem now is every time you say something, it, it fuels the news cycle. I mean, I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal a few days ago about the Andrew Cuomo situation. And this was before his press conference. And I said, well, let me tell you what's gonna happen. He's going to hold his press conference. He's going to apologize. And the apology will declare, be declared to have failed. Because that's the way it works. That's what social media does. Social media doesn't stand up and say, well, well, well articulated. Thank you. Social media's job is to go, it was insincere. It was too little, too late. He should be fired. That's what I mean by in Glassjaw, the fiasco vortex. And that's what I do in false light where we have to go after somebody's reputation, make the bad allegations run faster than any correction possibly could. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, the question from our friend, um, uh, Denis Selnik. Uh, so what is your take on disinformation for hire? 
I read about some firms that will work the system to share out fake news to support their clients while yeah. talking about unethical. Uh, how does the industry deal with that? Um, there is no system to punish these types of firms, no sanctions, so to speak. Well, he, he's absolutely right. And by the way, um, one thing I want to make clear is we've been approached on things like that. We will have nothing to do with um, my, my clients, while it's hard enough to talk in them into being assertive, the idea that I could go before a corporate board and say, I have an idea, we're going to make stuff up and, um, you know, it, it, it would, it wouldn't work. Um, most part of the sanction is legal. Okay. Um, if you, I, I can't cite chapter and verse about what the laws are. But there are implications with the Federal Trade Commission and others that you can't be sitting there. I mean, I, I, I can't be sitting there manufacturing truly fake news and pushing it out there. So there are legal sanctions. The problem is, if you're doing it from Estonia, how do you get them? You can't. There is, you know... I mean, when I was working on my spy book, this was right when all of the Russia stuff was happening. And one of the things that I was explaining to people is there, Putin is operating with absolutely no risk. There is no problem for him to put truly fake news. And by the way, we, can, we have to clarify the term fake news. Trump uses fake news to mean news I don't like. That's not fake news. Fake news is completely manufactured information that is usually pushed out on social media. Where I think Trump has got, gained traction, not entirely incorrectly, by the way, is on agenda-driven news. He's calling agenda-driven news fake news. I don't believe the New York Times is sitting there day after day generating fake news. They're not. What they are doing is they have a point of view, as does MSNBC, as does Fox, as does talk radio, that they promulgate. That's not fake. I mean, stuff in there may be fake, but I think so one of the sanctions is legal. The other is sunlight. If one of my clients got caught falsely, I mean, we've, we've worked on cases. I mean, I can give, give you an example. We did some work for the in, uh, consumer product industry that made feminine care products. There were allegations that women were getting very sick for using these products. In 19, in the early 80s, there really was something called toxic shock where women were died and were very sick. Well, they had to take it seriously. To make a long story short, we were able to find out that all of these sick women a few years ago Nobody could find them. They could find them in 1980. They couldn't find them in 2007 or something. Where were they? We determined that there was an all natural feminine care company with trolls in a trailer somewhere in the Midwest sending zillions of emails into newsrooms across the country, mimicking the idea that women were getting sick. Their strategy was to cut into the mainstream manufacturers by uh, alleging dangerous manufacturing practices. We went back to the mainstream news media who in their, to their credit, we said, you've been conned, here's what's happening. And most of them said, you're absolutely right. They did not like being used and they, embarrassed, they exposed it, they embarrassed it. So the answer is some combination of legal sanction when you can, sunlight and, and embarrassment, as well as to some degree regulation. Um, now, you know, one area that I don't care for is, uh, you know, it, that is within this domain is mainstream news organizations do not like it when advocacy organizations go to alternative media. They don't like it when you go to think tanks, when you go to bloggers, um, because they like the idea, no, we here 
control what goes out. If you, the, the, in false light, there is a made up news organization I call the capital incursion. And one of the things that's going on there is they are getting a steady drumbeat of news stories from plaintiff's lawyers. And what I believe, and this, this part is real life, and I've, I have debated this on panels, and it doesn't go well, by the way, where mainstream media organizations for the last 40 years have been accepting billions of dollars in in-kind services from plaintiff's lawyers, left of center NGOs, short sellers, and basically are transcribing it. But when one of my clients gives $20,000 to a think tank to study something and they write op-eds about it, suddenly the wrath of the media come down on them. I, I think that that's a real problem because I do think people are allowed to defend themselves. They're allowed to spend money to defend themselves. And one of the worst friendship ending fights I ever had with a friend who was a journalist was when he said, you know, your clients aren't very transparent. And I said, who are your sources? Well, we don't discuss our sources. Well, you're not transparent either. So we have to, we have to really wrestle with this, but I do think the issue of fake news is going to be an ongoing punitive thing and should be, there, there should be harassment to those parties, but it's just beginning. Uh, there is a question from our co-founder, uh, Eric Shirayev, uh, about any types of cases that you consider your favorite and uh, you had skills and experience to solve those uh, issues. But I think you kind of uh, already uh, mentioned some of those cases, unless you can think of any others. Um, so um, I would like to ask you, uh, in connection to that question, whether uh, you were able to write about any of your cases in the books that you recommend. Right. And if there are any books out there that aside from Glass Joe and False Slide that we should read.